Hello everybody, I'm Frances Crook, I'm the Chief Executive of the Howard Lee for Penal Reform and I'd like to welcome you here this evening. It's lovely to see so many people. Uh, we were so panic struck by the number of people who wanted to come that we've actually turned away about 200. Uh, so you are the elite, uh, the special ones. Um, so it is very nice to see you here. Uh, the first thing I should say is that, will you please put your hand up if you're not a member of the Howard League? Well, you should be ashamed of yourselves. <laughs> There's a membership stall outside, and we will be... I have noticed every single one of you. Um, we are a charity. We do rely on, uh, on donations. We don't take money from the government apart from when we take it off them, which is a completely different matter. Um, and that's through our legal work. So um, I'm not going to say anything more about the Howard League. I do hope those of you who don't know will find out about it. I'm incredibly honoured to be uh, here to introduce to you Lord Justice Leveson. Um, apart from being one of our most distinguished judges, he's also a Liverpudlian, a Scouser. And that is a wonderful thing. I've spent many happy years in Liverpool, um, and it's a very, very special place. Um, he is, he's ha had the most amazing and distinguished career, having been uh, the senior presiding judge and, of course, chairman of the Sentencing Council and chaired, as you all know, the inquiry into the culture, practices and ethics of the press. Um, that made him somewhat of a reluctant celebrity, as we found when we came in and had to watch through the television cameras asking ridiculous questions. I mean, really sensible questions. Um, and, of course, is now president of the Queen's Bench. Uh, he's going to be talking about consistency in sentencing, which is an incredibly important issue because, as I was explaining uh, when um, in the Green Room, I was in a local prison in London recently, and uh, there was one uniform member of staff to 150 prisoners. So we have to do something about the overcrowding and the overuse of prisons if we're going to have any kind of sensible justice system. So that's my challenge to the Sentencing Council. And uh, Sir Brian, would you like to address this? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, can I start by thanking you for the invitation to give this the fifth annual lecture held in memory of Milo Cripps, the fourth Lord Palmore, a colourful character who clearly lived a wonderfully varied life. While at Oxford, and whether to celebrate his birthday or the age of his car, he is said to have filled its radiator with champagne <laughs> in Berkeley Square. And he left the university not knowing what he wanted to do. He went on to become a banker, a bookseller dealing in antiquarian books, and most famously a large botanical collection, a traveller, and, most important, a staunch supporter of the work of the Howard League for Penal Reform. I'm delighted to be able to use this opportunity to speak to you about the work of the Sensing Council, of which I've been chairman since late 2009, which was prior to its legislative birth in April 2010. The Sensing Council is an independent, non-departmental public body of the Ministry of Justice, and, re and replaced the Sentencing Guidelines Council and the Sentencing Advisory Panel. Its primary role is to issue guidelines for both magistrates and the Crown Court on sentencing. The Coroners and Justice Act 2009 provides that these guidelines must be followed unless it is in the interests of justice not to do so. We also have statutory responsibilities in relation to research and public confidence. And we have taken this remit to launch wide-ranging publicity around the process of sentencing. So what about the history? Sentencing guidelines are not new. Sentencing decisions of the Court of Appeal gave guidance to judges and, from the 1980s, it became increasingly common for the court to provide generic advice beyond the limits of the particular case or cases then being decided. The Crime and Disorder Act 1998 created the Sentencing Advisory Panel to provide research advice to the Court of Appeal. And the Criminal Justice Act 2003 
created the Sentencing Guidelines Council, which provided guidelines to which the courts had to have regard. Following the explosion in the prison population and the report of Lord Carter of Coles and a report of a committee chaired by Lord Justice Gage, the Sentencing Council, had, with more wide-ranging responsibilities, amalgamated both earlier bodies. So, what of the Council? Since it came into being on the 6th of April 2010, the aims of the Council have been to promote a clear, fair and consistent approach to sentencing, primarily by issuing sentencing guidelines, to produce analysis and research on sentencing, and to work to improve public confidence in sentencing. Recognising that it would require rather more time than the Lord Chief Justice could spare, he is no longer the Chairman, as he was of the Sentencing Guidelines Council, but rather its President. As I have said, I have been Chairman since the commencement of the legislation in April 2010, although I had the responsibility of setting up the operation following the passage of the legislation in autumn 2009. As for its membership, the judges are in the majority. There are eight out of a total membership of the Council of 14. Two from the Court of Appeal, two High Court judges, two circuit judges, a district judge and a magistrate. I believe the balance is correct with representation from across the judicial spectrum allowing for a diversity of judicial viewpoints. Judges are the professional sentences used to balancing the dictates of the legislation the guidelines and judgments of the Court of Appeal, and fitting that mix into the facts of the case. They've had a professional lifetime for the full-time judges, whether as barristers or solicitors, or judges part-time and full-time in doing the job. They're in the best position to know what will help judges and magistrates, and making use of the expertise available, whether any possible changes to the format would assist the process. But the six non-judicial members of the Council play an equal role and there is no question of them being overridden. They are each heavy hitters in their own fields. They include the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Chief Constable of Surrey Police Force, the last police officer to be a member of the Council being the Deputy Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police, the Chief Executive of Victim Support, a Professor of Criminology at Oxford University, a former Chief Executive of the Greater Manchester Probation Trust, and a Defence Solicitor with direct and recent experience advising clients in police stations and before court on likely sentence. It's this breadth of viewpoint that has enhanced the work of the Sentencing Council as it has developed its guidelines. And let me make it clear that the six non-judges challenge the judges of the council vigorously and to real effect. There is no undue deference and for the avoidance of doubt we have never proceeded otherwise than by consensus. Why is all this important? The council's aim in drafting sentencing guidelines include not only promoting a consistent approach to sentencing but, as I've said, we also endeavour to improve the public's understanding of the process, that is, the process involved in sensing offenders and the likely outcomes. In other words, we want to dis demystify sentencing and get the public to understand what we are doing in their name and why. In order to ensure that we, had a wide, we have a wide range of academic views, the Council is supported by two advisers with a lifetime experience in the field, together with a small multidisciplinary team of civil servants who make up the office of the Sentencing Council. This team has a number of specialists in the form of policy advisors, lawyers, an economist, social researchers, statisticians and a communications team. I am immensely proud to say that the talent, commitment and enthusiasm of the team was recognised not just by me, but publicly when they won the Guardian Public Service Award for evidence-based policy last year for the definitive drugs guideline. When presenting the award, the observers Andrew Rawnsley said of the work, this work, 
and I quote, the combination of methods employed from analytical tools to staff efforts and the overall complexity of their approach is deeply impressive. It is thorough, unique and highly innovative. So how judges use the guideline and when did they depart from one? The Coroners and Justice Act provides a different starting point for the proper considerations of the guidelines to that prescribed by the 2003 Act. At that time, the Court of Appeal before that Act, Court of Appeal guidelines were intended to lead judges towards consistent sentencing. Under that Act, judges were required to have regard to the guidelines. The 2009 Act now states that judges must follow the guidelines, except when it is in the interests of justice not to do so. I frequently put it in this way, that the guidelines define a common approach to sentencing, leaving the eventual outcome to the discretion of the judge based on the facts and circumstances of the case before him or her. Judges are also obliged to give reasons when departing from the guideline. So what's the work done to date? The Council has developed and promulgated five sets of definitive guidelines for assault, burglary, drugs, allocation totality and TICs, and dangerous dogs. We started with assault because the old guideline was much criticised and we needed a comparatively compact offence group to develop a new approach. We dealt with burglary and drugs because the sensing advisory panel had issued advice in relation to these offences and we wanted to use that advice and the benefit of their research and expertise while it remained up to date. Following consultation, Definitive guidelines on sexual offences are due to be published at the end of the year. That's this year, following upon work which has taken us over two years. It has been the most difficult piece of work that we've undertaken. We will also be publishing a guideline on environmental offences early next year. The Council has very recently finished a, cons a consultation on sentencing both individuals and corporate offenders convicted of fraud, bribery and money laundering offences, also with a view to publishing a definitive guideline in the spring of next year, although it will be foreshadowed in relation to corporate offenders because of the likely introduction of deferred prosecution agreements somewhat earlier. Work on health, on health and safety offences and theft is also underway. We welcome suggestions and requests for guidelines from outside organisations and sentences and have received a number of requests on topics as varied such as level crossings, feed and food offences, and farriery, to name but a few. <laughs> if I may, I'd like to outline the process of creating a guideline, because there should be no secrets about that. First, the Council identifies its priorities and agrees a work programme. That programme might be based on which offence lacks a clear guideline or because we've been required by statute to look at a particular area. And guilty pleas is an example of this and we've started work on that having originally started some years ago until the government considered intervening by statute whereupon we delayed what we were doing. The current work on fraud, bribery and money laundering offences is an example of the Council amending the work pro programme because the Lord Chancellor requested us to produce guidelines for sentencing corporate offenders to support its legislation on deferred prosecution agreements, as I've said. And it made no sense at all to do that small part of fraud and bribery and the like without dealing with the whole offence. The Council also considers whether a guideline is necessary because the offence is high in volume or where it considers the current guideline needs to be revised. The next stage is to undertake research, whether this be legal, analytical, or through engagement with interested groups and the public, to create an initial draft guideline. I'll return a little later to the valuable work of the Council's research team. The Council receives value, really values the input of organisations, such as the Howard League, who can bring their experience to bear in the early stages of developing guidelines. 
The Sexual Offences Guideline we're currently finalising is a good example of us seeking assistance from experts in the field as we work closely with Rape Crisis and organisations supporting victims of trafficking. The research often takes the form of interviews and focus groups with victims and members of the public to ascertain their views on appropriate harm and culpability factors and the levels of sentencing they consider appropriate. We've also increasingly relied upon interviews with judges to ascertain the effect of a guideline proposal on sentencing practice. One Crown Court judge who was interviewed in the early state development stage of the sex offences guideline and then again during the consultation period commented, I knew what I've said to you in the past and a number of things I've said to you were in the guidelines and the discussion element and I thought, they're listening. And it was clear the groups you'd spoken to. The guidelines have adopted a step-by-step -step approach which the Council believes is easier for judges and magistrates to apply and, very important, easier for the public, including victims and witnesses, to follow. Each guideline includes individually tailored processes for each different type of offence, meaning that they're all self-contained and comprehensive and contained in two or three pages with no need to refer back and forth to other parts of the guideline or indeed other documents altogether. I hope you agree that this is sensible. It was, in fact, quite a departure from the then existing guidelines. We returned to first principles of sentencing and opted to focus on attention on the two key determinants of seriousness defined in section 143, one of the Criminal Justice Act 2003, namely harm and culpability. Weighting those two determinants equally in order to re reach a specific category of offence within guidelines represents a different approach from previous guidelines which focused on scenarios which judges found restrictive and resulted in offences being effectively shoehorned into the scenario most closely resembling the case in hand. Our approach allows for a clear structure which can be broadly replicated for all offences. I emphasise we're not wedded to an exact and limiting structure. Some guidelines will require slightly different formats, but the principle will remain the same, which is important in encouraging a consistent approach. So, what of the structure? Let me use the assault guideline to illustrate the model. This approach has been tried across a number of offence types and is now understood and supported by the overwhelming majority of the many whom we've consulted. It consists of a series of steps. For the purchase of this speech, I'll summarise only. If I'm allowed also to make a plug, please go onto the website and read the guideline in detail. The first step is to determine the offence category. There are three. First, greater harm and greater culpability. Second, greater harm and lesser culpability, or lesser harm and greater culpability. And third, lesser harm and lesser culpability. At this stage, the court does not consider the defendant's previous convictions or whether he has pleaded guilty or been convicted after trial. The assessment of harm and culpability at step one is based solely on the principal identified factual elements of the offence. Any factors not considered here could be considered at the next stage. In that way, we avoid double counting features of sentence. The factors indicating greater harm are three in number. First, injury which is serious in the context of the range of injuries that can be pre presented for this offence. Injury which is serious in the context of the offence is, is what I've said. It's not sufficient for the victim to have an injury which meets the criteria of the offence. It must be serious in the context of the range of injuries which can occur, occur and that can, of course, include psychological harm. Secondly, the fact that the victim is particularly vulnerable because of personal circumstances. It will be for the, sen the sentencer to assess when a victim comes within this description. An example would be vulnerability to attack because of age, whether extreme youth or el being elderly or infirm. A victim of domestic violence could fall into this category if, for example, they've been isolated from family and friends by the, offem by the offender. Third, sustained or repeated assault on the same victim. What might constitute lesser harm? Injury which is less serious in the context of the offence. Again, 
This will involve an assessment by the sentencer as to where on the scale of injuries for an offence a particular injury falls. Turning to culpability, factors indicating higher culpability include statutory aggravating factors such as motivation or hostility based on sexual orientation or disability, although for Section 20 and Section 47 of the Offence Against the Person Act and for common assault, not racial or religious motivation because Section 29 of the Crime and Disorder Act 1998 specifically creates an aggravated form of that offence. Other factors indicating higher culpability are a sufficient, significant degree of premeditation, with the sentencer again assessing where on the gradient of premeditation the facts of the case lie. Also the use of a weapon or weapon equivalent, intention to commit more serious harm than actually resulted, deliberately causing more harm than necessary for the commission of the offence, deliberately targeting a vulnerable victim, leading a role in a group or gang, an offence motivated by or demonstrating hostility based on age, sex, gender identity or presumed gender identity. Factors indicating lower culpability are lack of premeditation, again as assessed by the senator, being a subordinate role in a group or gang, a greater degree of provocation than normally expected, mental disorder or learning disability where linked to the commission of the offence, excessive self-defence. Self so what does the court do where there may be no factors present indicating higher or lower culpability? Well, we believe that information will be available in most, if not all, cases that will lead the sentencer to conclude that there is evidence of one or the other, with the discretion ultimately left to the court. Bearing in mind, I repeat, that step two factors, which I'm about to outline, should not be considered in making this decision to avoid the potential for double counting. Once the court has decided where the facts fit within the harm and culpability range, it moves to identify which one of the three category ranges applies to each of to the offence. Each category has a range of sentences and starting points. Once the starting point has been identified, the sentencer moves on to consider any additional factual elements providing the context of the offence and any factors relating to the offender, which may result in the sentence moving up or down from the starting point. The guideline sets out the most relevant aggravating factors and mitigating factors for each offence. Unlike the step one factors, this is not an exhaustive list. We've never been able to identify or list.